Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a campaign that unites a lot of us from disparate political groups, uh, from different political organisations, that perhaps in areas where we don't always agree. We're recognising that there is a better way for this country. It's a way where it doesn't matter whether you've been, your family's been here for a thousand years or a thousand days or you became a citizen ten days ago. We are all Australians and we want the best for this country and we want the best for all of us out of this country. And I say we're disparate political citizens because the next speaker is someone who was a minister in the Labor government. Dr Gary Johns was, uh, described himself as an economic rationalist on the way in. He said he was only one of two in the uh, Keating government um, and the Hawke government. Um, I don't know anyone that is not a rationalist who's interested in economics. There's plenty of irrational people out there, I guess, but they're certainly not interested in the future of this country. That's what I would say. But uh, Gary, Dr Gary Johns was in the House of Representatives from 1987 to 1996. He held the Queensland seat of Petrie for the ALP and he served as a minister in the Keating government, as I mentioned. He's also the author of the book that Sarah held up earlier, The Burden of Culture. It's an excellent book and I'm sure he'll reference it a bit today. Gary has encouraged Aboriginal leaders right across Australia to provide guidance to people in remote communities on how they can be their most successful selves. He said Aboriginal leaders did not need a change to the constitution in order to be successful. He's a committee member of Recognise a Better Way. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr Gary Johns. Corey, thank you. It's a delight to be with you. I have such a, an exuberant, enthusiastic crowd. Um, and, and, of course, to be here with Sarah and Pauline and Kerry. It's wonderful to be with people who are all on the no side. Now, uh, Sarah posed the question, which I'm going to try and answer. She said of the South Australian legislation, what's the harm? And we might pose that to the referendum. What's the harm? I'll tell you what the harm is. Aboriginal people are a modern people. They all have mobile phones, especially the kids. You cannot escape the modern world. But what's happened, it's certainly in the last 30 or 40 years, is that about 20% of Aboriginal people have been prevented from making use of the modern world. That's what's killing their kids. And we did that. Up until 1967, the assumption was that Aboriginal people would learn how to live in a modern society. It wasn't our society, it wasn't a white society, it was just the one we we're all gifted by thousands of years of history. And of course we brought it to this land. But there was no turning back. You have to learn to adjust to the circumstances that are before you or the consequences are dire. So I was talking to an Aboriginal woman from Fremantle recently, uh, a woman of my age, and she said, we did all this in 1967. We did everything you asked of us. We are now teachers, doctors, accountants, electricians. We did it. We came into this society. What more can you ask of us? This is the tragedy. This stupid idea will mean that the last 20% who are in crisis, the children who are being sexually abused, the women who are being beaten, and the blokes who don't know what the heck they're meant to do in this society, are being held out. In 1967, uh, Kath Walker, Ujuru New Knuckle, known up our way in Queensland, said, wrote to the, the effect, um, the white man had to become civilised, now it's our turn. Now, you couldn't say that today without getting into trouble. But it was true that we made a transition too. We were all once hunters and gatherers, but we moved on. And we were gifted that. So I think we've brought a gift to this country. And most Aboriginal people are grateful for that gift. How many? Well, I say it's this. About 80% of Aboriginal people are doing about as well as other Australians. 
we don't hear about that so much. But it's the last 20% who've not, to use an old term, come in. Who are the last 20%? Tragically, 20% of Aboriginal men have been to jail. 20%. A lesser number of Aboriginal women, but unfortunately climbing. Now, those people are just recycling in that system because for the last 30 or 40 years, we've said being Aboriginal is enough. You just stay there on collective title and do your cultural thing and then we will bring things to you. And there's an old uh, vicar mate of mine who was out at, out at Owen Pally for many years, a, a missionary, a good man. He, got, he left because he was sick of burying children. He said, these people are radically disabled because there's nothing we will not do for them. So therefore, there is nothing they can do for themselves. So if you want to cast blame, you can, you can blame us, that's okay. But the job now is to bring the last 20% in. Now, how do we do that? So in 1952, when I was born, there was an advertisement in the paper from the University of Sydney uh, for scholarships for Aboriginal boys. Old term, really, but our society was open at the highest level for Aboriginal people to come in and, and make best use of our greatest, or in Sydney University's case, once greatest institutions. So for 70 years, the door has been open. And it's been mostly taken up. But today, you can go to any number of communities, especially in remote Australia, and you'll find childcare centres with beautiful infrastructure there with few or no Aboriginal children in them. What has happened here is that it's not that we don't provide the access it's just that some Aboriginal people no longer want it. So there's an attitude which has grown in the last several decades that says, you owe us, you give us everything we want, but we don't have to play your game. Now, that's a cruel attitude. It's the attitude, it's the culture, if you like, that's killing Aboriginal people. We are not killing them because we're not listening to them. In fact, one of the worst things you can do is listen to the victim because the victim will always say, if you give me more, this wouldn't have happened. But we know that giving more makes them less able. So how do we get around this? Right now, there are children who need protection from their own homes. So Best Price, this is Jacinta Price, Senator Jacinta Price's mum, is deputy principal of the school in Alice Springs. She's trying to, I think it's Yipinrinya, it's hard to pronounce. She's trying to raise funds for a boarding house in her school in Alice Springs. She wants those kids to be in boarding schools to be protected from their own families. Now again, you can blame us for that. It doesn't matter. How are you going to save these children who need protection from their own families? And there have been at least six commissions and royal commissions of inquiry into Aboriginal child sexual abuse in this country. The evidence is clear. You go to many of these communities, most of the children have been sexually abused might have been from white men, but mainly from their own. Because these communities have turned in on themselves. They are crushing themselves because we stopped inviting them into the open society 50 years ago. How do we do this? The whole idea of self-determination, collective self-determination, is what's killing Aboriginal people. So the game now, and the voice would be a little cherry on top, says only an Aboriginal person running an Aboriginal organisation can do good things for Aboriginal people. 
I can tell you that's a death sentence because I've looked at a lot of those Aboriginal organisations and the claims they make about being better at or for Aboriginal people are just wrong. The proof is not there or the proof is that the claims are untrue. So if you go down to Nowra, say, in uh, New South Wales, southern New South Wales, and as I have and I've talked to a woman there running uh, a, women, a women's child centre, and you've got to be very sensitive when you have these sort of conversations. I say, do you get any Aboriginal women in here? Yes. Well, why don't they go to the Aboriginal controlled health centre up the road? Because, and she said, well, <clears throat> if you're in the wrong family, they won't help you. So collectivism is a bad thing. We, I presume, don't worry about who runs the local GP's clinic or what family they're from. We just know that they'll be well trained and we'll get good medical advice when we get there. So the whole idea of Aboriginal self-determination is a very nasty ideology. I'll tell you where it got a big boost. Into the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. And if you look at the five volumes of the uh, Commission's report, yes, I've read them all many times, there are 250 different mentions of Aboriginal self-determination and not one of them defines it. They were groping for an idea. And it was Mick Dodson who wrote that stuff. And I'll tell you about the Commission. The Commission was an inquiry into the deaths of 99 Aboriginal people in custody. None <coughs> met their death by ill means. The police or the custodians did not kill them. Most people in custody today die because of ill health. They're in jail because they are knocked about badly, usually on drugs. The, fortunately, the number of deaths in custody, black and white, has, has dropped over the years because we do take more care. We have more insight. But then in 1991, the proportion of deaths in custody for blacks was the same as for whites. And we knew that after six weeks of the inquiry. The government suppressed that and went on and they turned it into this mega social science exercise in promoting self-determination. So the whole course of events since then is about Aboriginal self-determination and the voice, if you like, will be, you know, the piece de resistance it will really embed it in the Constitution. So let's come to the voice. Oh, by the way, remember that earlier this year, Noel Pearson was singing the praises of the Uluru Statement, which was voice, treaty and truth-telling. Then they realised that wasn't going down so well, so they hid Uluru, which is difficult to do. It's a big rock, but they, they, they got rid of it. And then they just started to talk about the voice, and then when we good people got started to, st started to get stuck into the voice, they now just talk about recognition. So the thing is quietly fading away over time. Hopefully to a point where we smash it in the next couple of months. And I don't mean, that's a rough term I know. But we need to defeat this heavily to send a signal that we're not going to continue down the path of Aboriginal self-determination because that's what's preventing the last 20% from having a decent life. It's a killer. And I say to the Noel Pearsons and Marcia Langtons and Tom Kalmers of the world, have a look at yourselves. What was your journey? How come you made it without change in the Constitution, without a treaty, without truth-telling? What's your story? And you'll find that the answer to the woes of the 20% lies in the lives of the 80%. We've done this. You know, the intermarriage rate between black and white in this country is about 70%. Like, that's reconciliation. You don't need a treaty between, well, maybe you do, between a man and a wife, <laughs> Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal. How can you have a treaty between an Aboriginal and a non-Aboriginal partnership? 
70% of all Aboriginal marri or ma marriages with an Aboriginal person are with a non-Aboriginal person. The reason the numbers keep climbing in the census is because the census, the ABS, encourages any child of a dis any child of an Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal person to be known as Aboriginal. So people tick the box. That should be of no consequence. We, we should set a target in this country that says there should be no race-based programs by 2030. Right? Nice it can be anyone's glass, it doesn't matter. Uh, there really shouldn't be because if we have to define race, it's a very ticklish issue. And, and I say to many of my friends who want to go down that track, I say, why bother? We shouldn't have any programs based on race. And then you can remove that ugly conversation about race. And just quietly, uh, and with great respect, um, you know, in 1901, this was a British society. You know, we were 98% British. And then there were uh, a very well-defined Aboriginal society. That's just not true anymore. You can walk down the Rundle Mall and wherever, and you'll find people of all races and all countries. So with great respect to Aboriginal people who are often no longer as identifiable as they race once were, you're just not that exotic. I'm not being crude or rude there. I'm just saying it's, it's just not as different as it was. You are modern people. You're less distinguished than distinguishable, as are we. And we, too, are trying to work out the best way to work and grow and live in this country, but some Aboriginal people have, s the lesson stopped, the lesson stopped. So the work that uh, church people did up until the late 60s was very sensible because they were providing food and shelter in a sense and they were bringing people in. Aboriginal people mostly came in voluntarily because it was easier to get food there than do all that hard work out in remote Australia. But having come in, the rules changed because women would often find comfort inside uh, the church or the grounds of the area because they didn't necessarily want to be going with an old man. So the Aboriginal society meant that old men took as many young women as they wanted. Pretty much the same as we did in earlier generations. But when women found that they were protected by the church, they started to change their culture. They realised there was a different way. And then, of course, there was the explicitly integrationist notion that you should learn to read and write English. Now, was that destroying their culture? I guess it was. Was it destroying their languages? I guess it was. But that's a done deal. That was done a long time ago. And by the way, um, if you're a person speaking Aboriginal language here and then you wanted to talk to someone 100 kilometres away, you, you couldn't understand each other. There was no unifying language among Aboriginal peoples. Fortunately, there is a unifying language in Australia today and it's English. It could have been different, you know. The Dutch might have had the North, the French could have had the West, the British could have had the East Coast. Um, I don't know who would want South Australia, but you know. <laughs> that's terrible. Cut that out of the film. You know what I mean? We could have been a nation, well, a country of many nations. We could have had wars on this land between European nations. So we should be grateful we just had the one group who came in with some of the best laws known to man and woman anywhere. So there's a beautiful little, how are we going? 
So there's a beautiful little story I'll finish on, um, which is about the bloke called Cable. He came in uh, as, uh, on, on the first fleet as a criminal. Convict, that's the word, Gary. And he lost his belongings. Now, you think that'll be game over. Mate, you're a convict, right? No rights. He sued the captain of the ship and won. <laughs> that was the importation of British justice from day one. Now, it hasn't been a, a clean rollout, but nevertheless, white men were hung for murdering blacks at the very earliest stages. And that doesn't mean to say there weren't awful violence by whites against blacks and the reverse. But that is history. Why would we tell those truths again when the only known truths are written down by us? It can't be any other way. There's one truth and I'll leave you on this. The real truth of the stories of Kerry White and other people uh, around Australia, other Aboriginal people, many, some of whom, sorry, are sitting on our group, recognise a better way. The truth is their life path. How come they made it without a treaty, without uh, a voice embedded in the Constitution and without truth-telling? So hats off to Kerry and all those Aboriginal people who are prepared to vote no. Thank you. Thank you.